Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends and family, and everybody else, such a great pleasure to be with you today on the latest edition of Real Talk with Billy and Corey, live from our homes at Zoom University. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Hot Take Billy Parvati. I'm on hand, joined by my podcast partner, Uncle Cornelius Michael. Some people call him Corey Van Dyke. Corey, it's great to be back with you for yet another one on Zoom. Yeah, great to be back, Billy, and uh, a, a great week of NFL football that we're going to dive right into, obviously, down to four teams left. Uh, great week of the playoffs and really excited to looking at these matchups and the matchups of the past week as well. And we're very excited to have a special guest with us today. Joining us for the first time is none other than Mitch Speltz. Mitch is uh, from Wisconsin. He went to school at uh, Viterbo University and uh, he's uh, working in radio there too. He works with uh, the sports league, John Papadopoulos, a guy I worked with as well out in Wisconsin. He uh, covers uh, Badger basketball for uh, John. He also He's a big Packers fan, which is why we wanted him here today to talk about the Packers in the NFC Championship game. Mitch, thanks so much for joining us, man. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on, guys. Well, let's get right to it, fellas. I mean, we are in the final four of the NFL playoffs. The conference championship games will be this Sunday. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers will face the Green Bay Packers, a matchup finally of Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers in the playoffs. And then on the AFC side, you've got the Bills against the Chiefs, the two best seeds in the AFC. But, of course, we had an exciting weekend this past weekend. The Chiefs, with their backup QB, Chad Henney, end up knocking off the Browns. You had the Bucks in a battle of two 40-plus-year-old quarterbacks end up winning that matchup, going to Tom Brady. Uh, the Packers end up dominating against the Rams. And then you had the Bills in a pretty, I think, stunning fashion, pretty much dominate the Ravens all game, 17-3. to Corey, I'll go to you first. What was your biggest storyline of the weekend? Biggest storyline? That's a good question. I, I think the the most intriguing game that it ended up being, which was not a lot of people expected, it was that that Browns Chiefs game. And you look at that game, and Chiefs kind of dominated early. They looked like they're going to run away with a you know two three touchdown win in that one. And then obviously Mahomes gets injured. He kind of I don't know, almost looked like he just kind of got choked out, got brought to the ground, and. He gets knocked out of the game. Second quarterback of the weekend to get knocked out of the game with a concussion after Lamar also got that uh, on, on the previous day on Saturday. But then, um, you know, the, the Browns start to battle back and, and really Chad Henney puts the, the finishing touches on it, which is funny to say. But, I mean, I think it, it was really just a game that showed the the true – the true greatness of Andy Reid that, that he's able to, to put his trust in Chad and he's able to, to have him go for it on that, that fourth and one, a gutsy play call where he doesn't just hand it off to his running back. He lets Chad Henney roll out to the right and, and make the first down pass. And it, it was a call that, you know, you look at it and say, man, that, that, that was gutsy. That was um, a call that, that wins you, you know, the game and could potentially, you know, look back and if they go on to win the Super Bowl, potentially could be, you know, the, the call that, that wins them that Super Bowl because you look at it and I don't know it, it just kind of had that feeling that if the Browns once the Browns punted that ball away with like four minutes left you kind of felt like that was their last chance so I feel like if they got the ball back there at the end obviously it would have been a tough situation but but the Chiefs defense isn't anything special so it certainly could have could have gotten could have put in a lot of Chiefs fans in in a a pressure packed situation at the end. So just, I think that was really the big story and we'll obviously be going forward to see what, what Pat Mahomes health is going into this AFC championship. Mitch, what were your thoughts on, you know, the Chiefs Browns game? I think for me, the biggest thing I saw was, I think there was a difference between having a veteran backup QB and a, a rookie or a, you know, a second year backup QB. I think you saw the big difference in the Ravens game and the uh, Chiefs game, the Ravens game, they had to bring in like McSorley, whatever his name is, uh, when it was still, you know, kind of, you know, Ravens had a shot. I mean, not that they were going to win, but they still kind of had a shot in there. And then you bring in a guy like Chad Henney, who, although he had never thrown a postseason pass, he's been an NFL veteran for 12 years. I think the fact that, and to be fair, I mean, he also had Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey, so pretty easy job on offense. But I think the fact that the Chiefs had a veteran quarterback in there enabled Andy Reid to kind of be aggressive and put that game away. But what were your thoughts on the Chiefs-Browns game? Absolutely. I think you make a good point about having that veteran backup quarterback, because when you lose your star quarterback, a lot can go wrong. I mean, Chad Henney did a nice job, you know, in keeping the ship afloat. I think at the end of the day of that game, I think you saw the difference between an experienced team that had won the Super Bowl against a team that's never been there before, because you look at that final drive for Cleveland, you just, I don't think the urgency was quite there. And I think they are too hesitant. They didn't take the shots they needed. I think the Chiefs deserve a lot of credit what they did defensively on that drive. But I think you look at 
the youth of the Browns. I think it really got them at times. You also look at that Rashard Higgins fumble. Had he have scored or at least not had the ball knocked free through the end zone, what could have happened in that game? But I think you have to be really impressed by what the Browns did this year. I think a lot of good things are coming for them. I think Baker Mayfield really matured this season, and they have a legitimate defense. But I think at the end of the day, it was youth against experience for Cleveland going up against Kansas City, and the Chiefs prevailed, who now ultimately have a tough test to to Buffalo at home. Let's uh, go to the, the next game in the AFC. You had the Ravens and the Bills. Corey, a lot of people, including me, thought that this was the game of the weekend. I mean, you had Lamar Jackson and that rushing attack against Josh Allen and that passing attack. But really, it looked like Buffalo dominated from the start. I mean, the Ravens, I think, had some chances to score in the first quarter. The win was clearly a factor because he had two really solid kickers and Justin Tucker and Tyler Bass missing field goals. But ultimately, Buffalo dominates at, at home and Seems like it's uh, go- turning out to be a pretty special season for Buffalo. What were your thoughts on the Ravens-Bills game? I mean, you say the Bills dominate, but I wouldn't say that's the story at all. I think you look at that game, and honestly, the, the Baltimore should have been, you know, ahead going into halftime. Justin Tucker misses two field goals. When does that ever happen? They, they So, you know, you say at worst they should have been up 9-3 to three going into the half. Their defense was dominant the whole game. I mean, you limited Josh Allen. Uh, you look at the final stats, he ended up uh, 23 of 37 for 206 yards. And he's a guy who's been putting up pretty much over 300 yards every week. Um, so really, for me, it wasn't, you know, a story of, of the Bills dominating the game. I mean, they only had, you know, 200, 200, a little over 200 yards of offense, you know, only 32 yards rushing the ball. Um, and they were really, they had the one drive coming out of the half that put them ahead 10 to three. And then obviously, the, the momentum killer, the, the big play of the game is that 101-yard interception return. Um, I mean, that's that's the killer right there for Baltimore. Your, your defense had been playing well all game. Um, the Bills' defense had obviously been playing great and shutting down the, the rushing attack that the Ravens wanted to do. But if you score there and you make it 10-10, to 10, that, that's a whole different ball game. And suddenly, you know, the, the center for the Ravens just had issue after issue with the snaps, and ultimately that led to – Lamar kind of getting walloped there in the end zone and getting concussed and out for the game. And that was really kind of the end of it from that point there. They weren't going to win that game coming back with, with a backup quarterback throwing into those swirling wins. So it, it was a, a game. I, I think I even had texted uh, the group that were in that this game is going to turn, you know, whoever makes the big turnover. And it, it ended up being the Ravens making that big turnover uh, that, that kind of swung the game. And Mitch, I think the bigger story for me was the fact that the Ravens imploded. I mean, this is a very dynamic team. You've got a Super Bowl winning coach, John Harbaugh, a very exciting quarterback, Lamar Jackson. But it just seems like despite their great rushing attack, when they get behind, especially, you know, more than one possession, they just have a very hard time moving the ball downfield. Lamar, you know, throwing the ball downfield. That was kind of my biggest takeaway. What was your biggest takeaway from this Baltimore-Buffalo game? I agree with Corey and what you're saying as well. I don't think the Bills did anything to win this game. I think the Ravens did more to lose it. I mean, missing two field goals with Justin Tucker certainly changed a lot of things. I know the win was certainly a factor for both sides, but I mean, those are two very uncharacteristic misses for Justin Tucker. Then you talk about the pick six in the end zone. Who knows what happens if he doesn't throw that or it doesn't go the other way for the touchdown. A lot could have happened. I don't think the Bills – it. It wasn't an impressive victory, obviously, in the playoffs to do anything to win, but a lot of things just didn't go right for the Ravens. They beat themselves in a regard, and then when Lamar Jackson got hurt, I think that was basically the nail in the coffin. Tyler Huntley did a lot of good things, you know, made it interesting a bit, but I don't think anybody ever thought he was going to bring them back completely. But I think Buffalo is still a very good team. I think they represent a challenge to Kansas City, but I think they are a bit of a flawed football team going into this next round because they still can't run the football. I mean, Josh Allen does it himself, but Devin Singletary, they, they can't run the ball with them. They a lot, rely a lot through throwing the football and you can run on the Chiefs, but if the Bills can't do it, that would make me a little skeptical about their ability to go to Kansas City and win. But I think they made enough plays to win, but I don't think they made any real big winning plays other than the pick six. Here's a question I wanted to pose to you guys before we move over to the NFC. Which team are you more sold on going for, the Ravens or the Browns? I think these are two very similar teams. You've got a couple of stellar running backs manning that rushing attack. I guess for me, I'm going to go with the Ravens just because I think the organization is more uh, stable. You've got a Super Bowl coach and John Harbaugh. You've got, I think, a good organization behind Lamar. Whereas I think with the Browns, uh, don't get me wrong, I think it would be great for football if you know they're able to kind of have a sustained period of success. But I just think it's hard for me to – go off of the Browns, uh, you know, being that team 
uh, after just one year. I still even uh, this might be crazy to say I I would still say even for one year next year I think I'd give the Steelers a bit of an edge over the Browns. I think they've got a better offense. I think Big Ben he's getting to the end of his career, but I think even for next year I would still give the Steelers a slight edge over the Browns. Maybe you guys think I'm crazy about that, but Corey, what do you think? Going forward, would you rather be more on the Ravens bandwagon or the Browns bandwagon? I mean, I think, honestly, the the Browns have a brighter future ahead. I think you look at them and they have all the pieces in place that you'd want right now. They have a, a young quarterback. They have a, a good receiving core. We forget that that OBJ has been out for, for the year with an injury, and he'll be coming back. Uh, you got guys like Landry in there as well and uh, Hooper as your tight end. And then, obviously, the running backs are, you know, arguably the two best a duo of running backs in the NFL with, with, with Chubb and Hunt. So I think you look at that, if they can add a couple pieces on defense in the off season, I think that's really where they need to make a move, especially in the secondary. Um, you have obviously Miles Garrett up front and the, the pressure that he can bring, but if they can, if they can make a move in the secondary, get, get a lockdown corner or a hard hidden safety or something like that. I think the Browns are the team to watch. Cause I, I think there's just so much with the Ravens, they're kind of a team that you can easily figure out if, if their game doesn't go one way, they're not going to win the game. Like you, you look at Lamar and he, honestly, he doesn't have a lot of great weapons around him. Like it, I'm not sold yet on, on JK Dobbins or, or Gus Edwards as a, a premier running back. I mean, Marquise Brown, he's not really a, a wide receiver one on many teams. So obviously you have Mark Andrews, a great tight end, but the, the weapons around Lamar a little bit kind of worried me as well with that Ravens team going forward. Mitch, what do you think? I mean, and again, if you look at this AFC North, you've still got the Steelers. You've got the Bengals, hopefully bringing back a healthy Joe Burrow. I mean, this division that you think in, in these next couple of years is going to get even tougher. But what do you think? Are you more sold on the Ravens or the Browns going forward? I think they're both here to stay personally, but I do think it is the Ravens still going forward. I've always been more of a believer in Lamar Jackson as a thrower of the football than others have. I think Corey makes a good point. He doesn't necessarily have the weapons around him to throw. But this is an offense that is contingent on running the football with Lamar Jackson and J.K. Dobbins and other running backs like Gus Edwards. Like, they have the weapons to run the football, and they do it better than anybody. Corey does make a good point, though. When they fall behind, things may change. But this is where I believe Lamar Jackson is more capable of bringing a team back through the air than I think some people give him credit for. I've always thought he's had a really good arm, and sometimes he does not make the greatest decisions and I, I think sometimes he is held back he doesn't have as good of an arm as some other people do but like I said I think both these teams are here to stay I'm not as sold as Pittsburgh on them going forward I think they need to move off Ben Roethlisberger I think he's kind of hold them back I think going forward I do think the Bengals of course are getting better so this is a strong division altogether but I think this is Baltimore and Cleveland going forward I give Baltimore the slight edge and I think they're more likely to make a run to the Super Bowl than Cleveland is. But I do think the Browns are really close as well. For sure. Well, let's move on to the NFC. And I want to save the Packers for like a big picture discussion. That's where we want to bring in your perspective, Mitch. But let's go to the Bucks versus the Saints. I mean, you had two 40-plus-year-old quarterback guys battling it out. You know, Tom Brady, Drew Brees. And I picked the Saints to win. I think Corey picked the Saints to win. But the Bucks end up upsetting the Saints uh, 30 to 20 in New Orleans. Uh, Tom Brady, it looked like just was able to. This was not a great offensive game despite the amount of points, uh, but it looked like Tom Brady, when it came down to it, was able to make some of those throws that, quite frankly, just looked like Drew Brees was old uh, in, in the last couple minutes of the game. Um, and it quite possibly could also be his final game. I know it was reported that he was going to retire, but I think he said he's not 100% sure yet. But I think all indications are Drew Brees will probably retire given his injury history, especially recently. Corey, what are your thoughts on this Bucks and Saints game? It seemed like a pretty disappointing end to potentially Drew Brees' career. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I look at it, and I think, you know, kind of in a similar vein to the the Bills and the Ravens game, it wasn't so much a game that, you know, the Bills won. It wasn't so much a game that the Bucks won. It was more so a game that, you know, I think the Saints lost it, where, you know, you turn the ball over three times. Um, three of those turnovers led to 21 points for the Bucks, and that just simply can't happen in the postseason like that. If you lose the turnover battle in the postseason, you likely lose the game. And to lose it by uh, a wide margin like that was really the difference in the game. And the one that we've talked about that was the, the big difference that kind of set it off was that Jared Cook fumble. I mean, the Saints are, are driving down the field. They're past midfield. Uh, it's a huge third down conversion to bring them to about the 45 or the 40. And then Cook just fumbles the ball when, you know, the Saints are up a touchdown at this point looking to potentially go ahead two touchdowns where, 
you know, Brady hasn't really led the offense down the field all game long. And if that happens, I think, you know, the Saints win that game. Um, Breeze was just coming off a nice drive. And then really that kind of set everything, you know, off kilter for, for New Orleans going forward. The Brady goes and leads the Bucks right down the field from about midfield right there. They score the touchdown to tie the game. And then Breeze comes out, and like you were saying, just, just looks old, looks like he was kind of the piece that was holding back this team, um, not really able to throw the ball much further than, than 10 yards down the field. Um, even, you know, they'd run the one trick play where they throw it deep and they bring Winston out there to throw it. Like you could have had Breeze out there being the guy to throw that, but I think it's even kind of telling that, that Winston was the guy that they brought in for that play uh, where they just really didn't trust him to throw it down the field at all. So I, I think it's, I mean, obviously Drew Breeze has, you know, a, a hall of fame career. He's a guy that, that will be in Canton one day and, and a guy that, you know, was one of the best quarterbacks that, that we've seen in our lifetime, but it was just really such a sad ending for him to see him as a shell of himself uh, to see him, you know, not in that normal breeze fashion where we're able to see him just diming up plays down the field. So I think that was kind of the big takeaway it was like, man, like the Saints team, I think has as many, as much talent as, as anyone that was in the playoffs this year. They just didn't have it at the quarterback position with Breeze in, in the long run. Mitch, what did you think about this game? I said going into the game, I think, of course, Drew Breeze has more pressure to win because it quite possibly could be his last game. But I thought it would have been, I think, an interesting uh, tidbit on Tom Brady's career if for the first time he goes to a division where there's another Hall of Fame quarterback. Because we all know when he was in the AFC East, I mean, there were not other good quarterbacks on those other teams. The first time he goes to another division with a Hall of Fame quarterback, he loses three times. I think I'm not saying that would have made him not wouldn't have made him the goat, but I think people would look back and say, well, that kind of is interesting, but he's able to get the win and prevent that from happening. So what were your thoughts on this game? Brady and the Bucks prevail over Breeze and the Saints. Yeah. My first thought on it, Billy, is I think this is it for Drew Breeze. He did not play very well and you can just tell his arm strength is very much diminished. And there was a point in me during that game where I thought, I think Jameis Winston gives him a better chance to win right now, but I think it's an ultimate move of disrespect if Sean Payton benches his Hall of Fame quarterback for Jameis Winston at that kind of magnitude of a game. But I think at the same time, that could have been a good storyline, Jameis Winston going up against his former team with a chance to knock him out. I think that would have been really something, but of course it didn't happen that way. But I do think the Bucs did a really nice job. I think they won the game because they capitalized off the Saints' mistakes. And New Orleans couldn't run the football. They had to throw it. And as a result, Drew Brees not able to do so. They lost the game. And I do think it sets up a very interesting storyline for the next round, which we'll touch on. But it, it just felt like, again, like Corey said, it felt like a game that the Bucs didn't really do a, a ton to win. I think they capitalized more on the mistakes more than anything. They did play well. They certainly played much better against the Saints than they did the first two times. But New Orleans, I think, beat themselves to a lot of self-inflicted wounds, setting up Tampa with great field position off those turnovers they set him up with. And, of course, me and Corey are both happy because our man from Virginia Tech, Bruce Arians, is heading to the uh, NFC Championship game. We also have Tremaine Edmonds, by the way, for the Bills on the other side, potentially could make the Super Bowl. Corey, I know you kind of went into it already, but give me your thoughts on uh, Drew Brees' career. I mean, if it is, in fact, his last game. Uh, in my opinion, he's a top-five quarterback of all time. I have him up there with Brady, Montana, Peyton Manning uh, and Breeze. I mean, he's right there on the top five. Aaron Rodgers would also be my top five. Um, he only won one Super Bowl, but of course, that's a lot more than a lot of other quarterbacks. Uh, you know, he's going to have all the, the stats, most of the stats in terms of most passing yards. Uh, he's up there with most touchdown passes. But what do you think is your thoughts on Drew Brees' career if, in fact, this past Sunday was his last game? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you look at his career and he – you know, has records everywhere of, of yardage and touchdowns and all these kinds of things. But I mean, I, I think it is, you know, I think Saints fans will, will look back on this and say, man, like we were only able to win one Super Bowl with that guy. And of course, we've seen it over the past couple of years, just the heartbreaking losses that the Saints have had uh, in the postseason. Obviously, the, the Minneapolis miracle and then that bogus non pass interference call against the Rams and losing to the Vikings again last year in overtime and all these kinds of things. And I mean, yes, he did win a Super Bowl, but I think there will be a lot of regret that, you know, with Sean Payton there, with, with the talent that they had around him all these years that he didn't get to win anymore. But I mean, I think that doesn't diminish anything from, from Drew Brees' career. He's obviously one of the, the best quarterbacks that we've seen, one of the better human beings that we've seen as well. And you, you look at Brees and, and just what – he's meant to that city of new Orleans, really. Uh, I think that's one of the bigger things that city, you know, going through 
everything that they had with Katrine there and being built back up and he him kind of you know later on becoming the face there afterwards and I don't know I so I think it, it's kind of a, a hard picture to look at and, and Breeze obviously has one of the best stories of a career either too where you know he, he gets injured at the end of his career with the Chargers and people are saying, thinking it might have been a, a career ending injury but then bounces back and becomes this guy that we've seen over the last decade plus so um, that, that's kind of the, the storyline I see there of Breeze. Great career, great person. Um, but really a lot of regret that I think Saints fans will look back on thinking, man, we only won one with him at the helm. Yeah, Mitch, that's what I was going to say. Is because if you look at – so they won their only Super Bowl in 2009. If you look at probably like 2011 through 2016, 17, I mean, there was a solid, what, five, six years where the Saints did not make the playoffs. They were not a good team. Now a lot of people talk about how they didn't really draft the defense to, you know uh, – help out Drew Brees, so maybe some of that wasn't his fault. But, I mean, you had a solid five, six-year span where he didn't – you know, his team wasn't good. They didn't make the playoffs. And I would even say, going back to what Corey was saying, I think it was the 2018 season, right, where they uh, lose to the Rams on that controversial call and uh, Rams end up, you know, getting destroyed – not destroyed, but they just didn't put up a good show in the Super Bowl, losing 13-3 to to the Patriots. I actually thought that was probably Brees' last best chance to win the Super Bowl. I, thought, I really do think that year – if they had made it to the Super Bowl, they would have beaten the Patriots. I thought that year the Saints had the best team uh, in the NFL. Unfortunately, they didn't make it. Um, so what are your thoughts on his career, Mitch? Again, a guy who I think is a top five quarterback. But again, if you probably look at it, he was never really considered the best quarterback in the league. I mean, you came in with Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, and then as he was leaving, you had Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, guys like that. Uh, again, it's still a great career, still a, a great person. And that's another thing, too, I want to add as I throw it to you is, do you think we moved the goalposts as sports fans? Because, you know, people say, oh, he didn't, you know, for guys who didn't win a ring, we'll say, oh, he never won a ring. But as soon as one of these great quarterbacks wins one ring, we're like, oh, they didn't win two rings. So what, what's your thoughts on kind of all of that as you try to analyze Drew Brees' career overall? Yeah, I think when you look at Drew Brees, I think you can easily think of him as the best statistical quarterback of all time. I think he put up as good a numbers as anybody. He's top the charts with touchdown passes, yards, completions, and so on, you know, you can argue he's the best statistical quarterback of all time, maybe not the greatest. And, you know, I think you guys make some good points about them having good teams. They were able to get to that second Super Bowl. And I've always found it fascinating, at least that's up here in Packer land, is that Aaron Rodgers takes a lot of criticism for only making it to one Super Bowl. He hasn't made it back since he won it way back in Super Bowl 45. But it always have felt like Drew Brees has never gotten that same criticism Aaron Rodgers has. I don't know if it's because people talk about Aaron Rodgers as perhaps the GOAT, and they don't really talk about Drew Brees that way. But it's always been fascinating that it's Drew Brees has never had that same thing, although Rodgers in that same window has been a lot better, and his Packer teams have been much better. I think for Drew Brees' sake, a lot of it has been because he's never had a good defense until these last few years. But – you know, I, I think Drew Brees is still very much top five quarterback, at least right on that cusp. Um, I think there's a lot of guys who are there that could go up or are projecting to go up above him, but he's certainly right there. Easy Hall of Famer. You would have liked to see him win one more Super Bowl, and they've had their chances to do so. I think you can argue last year as well. A lot of people thought they could have been a threat to make a run, but then lost to the Vikings in the first round. And I, I think it was a disappointing way for him to go out, no doubt about that, but I, you, you still can't overlook what Drew Brees accomplished in his career. And I think it's just a bit unfortunate it ended that way for him. For sure. Well, let's move on, guys, to the uh, matchups coming up this weekend. You have first the NFC Championship will be played at 1 o'clock. You've got the Packers and the Bucks for the first time ever in the postseason. After all of these years of hoping it would happen, we see it. Tom Brady taking on Aaron Rodgers. Mitch, I want to go to you first because you are the resident Packers fan here. First of all, Give me a big picture on what you thought about the Packers season. I mean, there were all these storylines going into the season. Packers drafted Jordan Love, which I believe but last time we talked, we were talking about this earlier. I think he said at the time it was the right decision. But you also did say you thought Aaron Rodgers had one more Super Bowl run in him. Um, and you look at, obviously, they won that Super Bowl back in, what, 2010. They haven't made it back, the Packers. But they have made it to a couple of NFC Championship games. I think it's the first one at home. And I was actually looking the other day, a couple of those NFC Championship games, had they beaten the – uh, Seahawks and the Falcons, they would have been a Brady Rodgers Super Bowl. Uh, and then last year, of course, they got, uh, you know, blown out by the 49ers. But what has your thoughts been on sort of this big season, uh, big picture of this season overall with the Packers and Aaron Rodgers hoping to make it back to the Super Bowl for the first time in about 10 years? 
Yeah, the Packers have never seen to have the best of luck when it comes to NFC Championship games, at least in the Aaron Rodgers era since they beat the Bears back in 2010. But I think you look at this Packers season, they certainly, I think, surprised a lot of people by how good this offense was when they didn't take a wide receiver at all in the draft. They didn't really sign one either. It was Devontae Adams, Adam Lazard, who got hurt at one point during the season, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and the emergence of the tight end, Robert Tunyon, this year has made this passing game very dynamic. But what makes Aaron Rodgers' season so interesting is that this is an offense under Matt LaFleur that's predicated on running the football first, and they've got multiple guys that do it, Aaron Jones, Jamal Williams, and A.J. Dillon, who's come on nicely at the end of the season, although he did get hurt against the Rams at the end of the game. But considering all that, how much they run the football, it's amazing Aaron Rodgers threw as many touchdown passes as he did, and at the efficiency rate as well. I mean, I think he had the second best – a passer rating for a season just came short of himself back in his 2011 MVP season. So the offense has clicked, I think, better than people have thought, considering they don't really have any other weapons besides Devontae Adams in the past game. At least that was the narrative coming into the season. Some guys obviously emerged. And the defense has gotten a lot better down the stretch. And I think their secondary is a part of their uh, defense that doesn't get talked about enough. Jair Alexander might be the best shutdown corner in the game right now. People don't talk about him. I know there's a lot of talk up here that he should have been a first team all pro probably over Xavier and Howard who had all the interceptions this year with the dolphins, but Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage at the safety positions have been very good as well. And a front seven, especially at the linebacking core that has certainly gotten better for green Bay over the last month or so. So they've been complete. I think during the latter part of the season, and their defense is certainly capable enough to win them games now, considering how much their offense is doing. But it just seems like this is a flawless football team right now going into the NFC Championship game as they get set to face a very good Tampa Bay team. Corey, what are your thoughts? We've got Brady and Rodgers in the NFC Championship game. Again, the big storyline is that it'll be in Green Bay. And, of course, Mitch was telling me before we you know, started this recording that it is snowing a little bit in Green Bay. So we'll see if those Florida boys are able to – uh, keep up with the Green Bay weather. And of course, Aaron Rodgers' first NFC Championship game. It's hard to believe it at home in his career. But what are you looking forward to most in Brady versus Rodgers or the Packers versus the Bucks? I mean, I think a lot of it too is people people forget, you know, people kind of looked at this season, looked at the Bucks and said they, they really didn't beat anyone. The one team they did beat though, and they they killed them was the Packers in the regular season, where I think Packers jumped out. I, I want to say it was a 10 nothing early lead and then they got the pick six, um, two pick sixes on Rodgers. Like, when has that ever happened? And the the Bucks really just exerted their force in that game, wound up winning that game, going away, and, and really was the one kind of signature win that they had in the regular season. I think, you know, you look at this game now, and I think Rodgers takes that personally. He's a guy that seems to take things personally, you know, taking Jordan Love, and he goes on this MVP season, different things like that. So I'm looking forward to that and that kind of storyline, the scene, you know, if that kind of drives this Packers team anymore. Um, I, I mean, I think you look at the Packers too, and they've just been an offensive juggernaut this year. Even, you know, going back to, to last game in the, the divisional round, they're playing, you know, the Rams and number one defense and they throw up, you know, close to 500 total yards on them. It was, it was an impressive display and they were doing it both passing the football and running the football. There's really no weakness in that offense right now. So, I mean, it, it is kind of the, the storyline, like you were saying of, of Rogers first game uh, in the NFC championship at home at Lambeau. And you, we've always kind of said that Lambeau is, is such a big home field advantage beyond, you know, other teams that we see in the playoffs, you know, to go to Lambeau and to beat a team in Lambeau obviously takes a lot, but it, it is also, you know, if you're going to say anyone can do it, you got to feel Tom Brady's the guy that could do it. So just a whole bunch of storylines there. Uh, I'm interested to see that kind of matchup, the, the battle of the Packers, uh, offense versus, you know, the, the defense that the Bucks are going to bring out there, an opportunistic defense that really kind of thrives off those turnovers. Like you saw in the first meeting between the two teams, like you even saw in the playoffs um, with the, the Bucks against the Saints, like we were talking about earlier. So, I mean, I think that's what the game comes down to. If, if the, if the Packers aren't, you know, turning the ball over, which, you know, Rogers is historically, you know, the best touchdown to interception ratio, a guy that does not turn the ball over typically, if he keeps a clean game back pack there, I, I think the Packers have a good chance moving forward in this one. Yeah, that's a, some some people may not know this stat, but these two conference championship games are actually both rematches of week six. Both of these teams played in week six, the Chiefs and the Bills and the Bucks and the Packers. Mitch, I wanted to ask you, how much pressure is Aaron Rodgers under to win 
not only this game, but win the Super Bowl this year. I mean, you look at his age, he's 37. So compared to Brady and Breeze, that <laughs> kind of feels like he's a young man. But, you know, you never know what can happen. One hit, you know, God forbid, could knock him out. Or maybe he suddenly takes a, a downward regression next season. How much pressure do you think he is the, uh, under this year to win it all? I think there's actually quite a bit, Billy. I mean, you never know what could happen next season. They do have some contracts they have to figure out with some key guys on their team. So you never know who's going to be back and who's not. But I think when you look at the other three quarterbacks and the pressure they're on, it's not even close to what Aaron Rodgers faces. I mean, Mahomes won the Super Bowl last year. Tom Brady has a handful of rings already. And Josh Allen is just freshly new into the league. I don't think anyone is expecting him to win a Super Bowl, at least at this stage of his career. So I think there's certainly – pressure on Rodgers, I think, specifically to win this next game because, I mean, he's mentioned before he wants one of these games at home, and now he finally has one against the Tampa Bay team that did beat them, of course, back early in the season, but a lot of things can change since then. And, was, and Green Bay has historically never played well in Tampa, so I think this is why it's so key for to get them up to Lambeau Field this time. And Rodgers at least needs to get to a second Super Bowl, I think. I mean, Considering he gets talk of the GOAT, I don't think he refers to that too much. I don't think that sinks in his head, you know, as much as people think. But at the same time, when you've had the career that he's had and he's only been to one Super Bowl, which he did win, he probably needs to get back to another one. And this, when you have a good opportunity like Green Bay has right now, you certainly got to take advantage of it. And that's actually a question I want to ask, Corey, is who is, who's under more pressure, Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes? I mean, I personally think it's Rodgers, but – I mean, look, I mean, the people thought the Chiefs were going to, uh, you know, roll over this field. I mean, people were like, oh, this Chiefs team, I mean, their defense is maybe a little bit suspect. But a lot of people, I think, thought, hey, man, you know, there's everything's cooking for the Chiefs to be able to repeat. Now, Mahomes did get banged up. But, you know, I, I think there's probably a decent amount of people that even going into the season said, I'd probably take the Chiefs against the field. I mean, it does seem like Mahomes and the Chiefs have been, you know, the, the favorites in this playoffs where they've been right up there with the Packers. I still think it's Rodgers, but I think there is a case to be made that Mahomes is under a lot of pressure as well, despite just winning the Super Bowl a year ago. What are your thoughts on that debate? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you could put that out there and really with kind of the Chiefs being the, the runaway favorites this year. But I mean, I think it still does go back to that that picture of, you know, if if the Chiefs don't win it this year, they still have a another decade plus with, with Mahomes at the helm, most likely to get it done a, another time or another few times potentially. But, you know, like we're saying with Rodgers, this is, you know, it could be the last run. They could have a, a, a couple more after this, but you kind of, when you're in a position like this, when you have a team like they have now, um, like Mitch was saying, without the the contract restrictions that are going to be coming up here shortly with guys like Aaron Jones and other people on their team, it, it really is a, a perfect scenario for them to get it done this year. And I think a lot of pressure on them as a result to get it done this year. All right, boys, well, let's put our money where our mouth is and make our picks for this game. Again, we're all very excited to see it happen. Corey, I'll start with you. Packers, Bucks, you did, for the record, pick the Chiefs and the Packers to uh, make it to the Super Bowl before uh, the playoffs started when we did our pick. So very much still could happen right now. Who are you picking this game between Green Bay and Tampa? Yeah, I did have uh, Packers versus Seahawks, and we see how that worked out with the Seahawks. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to go with the Packers moving forward. You know, I think – uh, I'll say something like 20, I'll say 28, 23 Packers move on. And I, I think, you know, the, the big story that a lot of people have kind of, you know, talked about so far with, with Brady at the helm is defensive generating pressure on him. You know, that you look at the Washington football team that was supposed to be their, their name of the game. Um, and they weren't able to get that done. Really the saints didn't put a whole lot of pressure on them. I think, you know, the, he's not the best player, but the most important player in this game might be Zadarius Smith. And if he's able to get after Brady, I think he does. I think that the Packers are able to generate a little pressure on them. Rodgers is able to do his thing. And I, I think the, the Packers pull out a close one. I said like 28, 23. Mitch, we know you're a Packers fan. So there's probably some bias in this pick, but what do you think? Does Green Bay have what it takes to make it back to the Super Bowl? I do. I think Green Bay will win this game. I'm going to go more on the likes of 34 to 20. I think Green Bay is going to handle Tampa. I think they're going to be able to play their game. I think getting them at home is a big deal. Tom Brady's played cold playoff games, but none of his teammates really have. And I think that's a big deal. Tampa hasn't been to the playoffs since 2007 prior to this year. So I do think the cold and the potential for snow will have an impact on some guys. But I think for Green Bay's perspective, the most important thing for them will be how their offensive line performs against the front seven of Tampa. 
We all know they're really good against the run, but Todd Bowles loves to blitz as well, and he blitzed Aaron Rodgers a lot back in week six when they played. They don't have David Bakhtiari, who, who tore his ACL in a practice right before week 17. So it's a big loss, but Green Bay's offensive line is still very, very good. I mean, they had two all-pros double-teaming Aaron Donald all last game, Corey Lindsley and Elton Jenkins. I think more people were going Aaron Donald's injury. Than he wasn't himself, but I think people forget about the fact Green Bay arguably had the two of the best guys at the position double teaming him. So can they hold off the blitz of Tampa? Aaron Rodgers was barely touched against the Rams and can they run the football? I don't think they need to bust out for 200 yards like they did against the Rams, but if they can run it with some success, set up play action and continue to throw the ball against a vulnerable Tampa secondary. I think Green Bay's offense can certainly continue to roll with over 30 points in this game and get the win. And I think the defense can make enough plays, but I think you don't want to put them in a tough spot. I think a lot of that's going to be predicated on if the offense can get them that early lead and they can play the game they want to play. So with that in mind, I think Green Bay will get the win in advance to the Super Bowl on Sunday. And do you have a score? Oh, yeah, you said like 34-20. Uh, 34-20 is going to be my prediction for this one. All right, cool. And I will also go with the Green Bay Packers to win this game. I just think – I think one thing people are not really talking about, guys, is I don't think Brady looked that good – uh, against the Saints I mean he did enough to win he didn't make mistakes but he looked at his stats I mean pretty pedestrian 199 yards two touchdown passes I just think this Packers team is is better than the Saints I mean Aaron Rodgers has shown he is not you know going off the cliff as Max Kellerman on first take likes to say I mean this guy is he's going to be the MVP this year I think he's on a mission they're playing at home in cold weather like you mentioned Mitch Brady may have played in cold weather playoff games but a lot of those guys haven't uh, Gronkowski has, but you know, much of the team, much of the team hasn't. I think the Packers are going to win this game. I'm going to go a similar score to Mitch. I'm going to say 35-21 Packers. I think they're going to get ahead by a couple touchdowns and pretty much control the game throughout. So, how about that? All three of us agree. Green Bay will be advancing to the Super Bowl with a win over the Bucks this weekend. We're very excited to see what happens in that game. Hopefully, uh, but let's move on now to the AFC and potentially just as intriguing of a game. You've got the Chiefs and the Bills, guys. This is obviously. The two best teams in the AFC, the Bills with the Bills Mafia, have been quite a story to watch this year with Sean uh, McDermott and Josh Allen, uh, the head coach and quarterback combo. Then you have the Chiefs who are the defending Super Bowl champions, but the question of Patrick Mahomes' health is obviously a big going into this game. He did not finish the game against the Browns, as we have talked about, but they're hoping he'll be back uh, for this AFC championship game against the Bills. Corey, what are your biggest thoughts going into this game? Probably the matchup we wanted to see in the AFC, Kansas City and Buffalo going head to head. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the real interesting thing to to watch in this game is really the, the Bills. You know, they they came into the playoffs on that hot streak. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many straight wins it was, but a team that was you know hotter than any team, and they really have not looked that great. Honestly, I mean, you could easily paint the picture that the Colts should have beat them in that opening round. Um, we had mentioned it before; it didn't look great against the Ravens. So I. I'm interested to see if it's going to be same story where the, the Bills are just kind of like you were saying, this pedestrian team in the playoffs, or if they come out and, and look like this team that we saw down the stretch, look like this team that we saw on, on Monday night football against the Patriots where they just blasted them. I think that's kind of going to be the story in this game. What, what Bills team are we going to get? Cause we, cause we kind of know what the chiefs are about. We know what they're going to be. We know the downfield passing that they're going to have with Hill and Kelsey and all these sort of things and the defense that'll make, you know, plays when they need to, but, but won't always, you know, keep a team scoreless or anything like that. So I think the story of the game is really on, you know, what Bill's team do we see? Do we see that team that we saw down the stretch or do we see this team that has kind of hit a few road bumps in the playoffs and, you know, still won despite that. And Mitch, we, we all thought this was going to be a great game if it were to happen, but it seems like if, especially if Patrick Mahomes is banged up and still starts, you, you, a lot of people think the Bills probably have a better shot now with the banged up Mahomes than they would have previously. What are your thoughts on this game? I know earlier you were talking about how the Bills, you know, may not uh, be, I think, as uh, dynamic of a team as people have said. But, you know, going into this matchup with uh, Patrick Mahomes that's less than 100 percent, you think, hey, they might have a shot to potentially pull this upset off. Yeah, I think that's going to be the downfall for Buffalo in this game. I know a lot of people like the Bills. If Mahomes plays, which I think he will. I think the Chiefs are going to win. Obviously, if he doesn't, I'm going to go Buffalo on that. But I think the Bills have to run the football because that's where the Chiefs are vulnerable on that side defensively. They give up a lot against the run, and I'm surprised the Browns didn't run on them a little bit more. I think 
they fell behind, they panicked, they threw the ball more than I think they wanted to, although Baker didn't really make any mistakes. I just don't think he made the winning plays at the end that maybe his run game could have set him up for. But I think because the Bills just cannot run the football effectively, that makes me really worried because the Chiefs secondary is actually not that bad. I mean, Tyron Matthews an all pro and then Rashad Breland is a very good cover corner as well. And I think the Chiefs are going to have maybe some struggles offensively as well. It'll be interesting to see if they get Clyde Edwards, the back for this game and how healthy Patrick Mahomes is. If he's back from that concussion, he still has a foot issue he appears to be dealing with, but I think if all, if the stars are aligned, I think the Kansas city chiefs are going to win this game by 10 or more points. Seems a little bit bold, but I just think matchup wise, this favors the chiefs. They did go to Buffalo earlier back in week six, like you mentioned, and they handled them pretty well. Buffalo didn't have a whole lot going. One thing Buffalo did do in that game really well was cover up Tyreek Hill. Tredavious White, one of the best cover corners, gave him next to nothing. Travis Kelsey still had a nice game. And because of that, I think if they limit Tyreek Hill, you still have a lot of weapons you have to cover up. And Patrick Mahomes knows how to distribute the football. He makes big time throws. We'll see how healthy he is. But I think the Chiefs are going to win this game. I think they're going to win it by more than people think. Corey, I wanted to ask you about Josh Allen. I mean, do you think he's, I don't want to say, I don't know if overhyped is the right word, but what, what are your thoughts on the season? Because I just think, you know, even if you compare him to, you know, some of the younger quarterbacks out there, I mean, he's not better than Mahomes. Uh, I guess my question is, where does he rank? I mean, you know, you got guys like Deshaun Watson, you've got guys like jo- uh, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson. I mean, where, where do you see Allen as ranking in terms of the young quarterbacks in the game today? I mean, I think you look at Josh Allen, he's certainly a guy. You could certainly even put him in MVP discussion this year. I think we can all agree Rodgers is going to win it, but he's a guy that I think probably finishes top three in MVP voting this year, just all that he's done. And, you know, really the, the story with, with Allen was he, he had all the tools. He has, you know, the, the physical makeup that you're looking for in a quarterback. He just has to put it all together, and he's really done that this year. You know, we've talked about it before. His completion percentage has, has jumped up 10 whole points. You know, he becomes – a guy that's completing less than, you know, 60% of his passes to a guy that's completing nearly 70% of his passes. And, and that's really the, the name of the game in the NFL. You got to complete passes. You got to complete passes down the field. They got him a weapon with Stefan Diggs and he's become a whole new player as well. Uh, Diggs has transformed into a, a top five wide receiver in the NFL this year. So you look at, look, look at it all. I mean, I think there's still even, you know, the scary thing for, for NFL, I think is that NFL defenses is that there's still, a lot of room for, for Josh Allen to grow. I believe if you get him, you know, a successful running back behind him as well, where there's a little balance, he can do some play action type stuff. That's, that's going to be a, a hard team to stop moving forward if they can get a piece in play there. So I think you look at, you know, his trajectory right now, it's, you know, potential through the roof. And I, I would put him as like a top, top like eight quarterback or so right now, I would say probably top eight, top 10 in that range right around there. And he's a guy that I think, you know, within the next year or two could even move into that top three, top four category. And, uh, yeah, we'll be very excited to see what happens with his career. Really quick, guys, before we make our official picks, Mitch, I'll go to you first. Do the Chiefs have any chance of winning this game if Patrick Mahomes is not the starter? I mean, do you think Chad Henney would be able to lead this Chiefs team to a victory? Again, this is assuming Mahomes doesn't play. Any shot for the Chiefs if he doesn't play? I don't see it because I think then Buffalo can settle in. I think they'll come in more confident if Mahomes is out, knowing their opportunity is there. The Chiefs offense isn't going to be as good as it normally is. I mean, I think Henry made plays in his brief outing against the Browns, but to go ask him to win a football game, I don't think he can do it. If he Can he save you a football game? Sure. Can he win you one? I, I don't think so. Not against a team that's as good as Buffalo. So if Mahomes is out, I would pick Buffalo. Corey, same question to you. I mean, to be fair to Henny, he basically started most of the second half. Now, most of the work was already done for him. But, hey, he made plays when he uh, needed to. But do you think the Chiefs have any chance of winning if Mahomes doesn't play? I mean, I think they have a chance. I think they would certainly have to have a lot go right. They would need to, to lean on their defense a little more, have the defense, you know, maybe make uh, Josh Allen have a mistake in their uh, a strip sack or an interception in their own territory or something along those lines. But, I certainly wouldn't put it out of the question. I think, you know, with those weapons that you do have with, with Kelsey and with uh, Terry Kill and even guys like Nicole Hardman that you can have, you know, doing reverses and stuff like that, jet sweeps. There, there's certainly a lot of pieces in place where, where Andy Reid could get some production out of Henny. Uh, we did see that in the second half. So I, I certainly wouldn't put it out of question that the, the Chiefs could, could win. I certainly think, you know, Bills would be favored um, if, if Mahomes isn't playing. But I think the at-home – 
with all that's in place and with Andy Reid kind of leading that team, I think Chad Henney could still lead that team to a win. Well, let's again put our money where our mouth is, guys, and make our picks for this game. Chiefs and Bills, the top two seeds of the AFC. Mitch, I'll go to you first. Who do you think wins the game? I'm going with Chiefs in this game, and again, I think they're going to win this game. If Mahomes is healthy, I think they're going to win by more than people think. I'm going to go 31-20, Chiefs win. Corey, Chiefs or Bills? I think the the Bills do show up in this one, but I think that the Chiefs, you know, with Mahomes at the helm and with everything going, I think it's the, I think it's going to be the better game of the weekend. I'm going to say, I'll say Chiefs 30-27 and a, a close nail biter at the end there. I'm going to go with the Buffalo Bills to pull off the upset in this game, guys. I just think, look, if Mahomes plays, I don't think he's going to be 100%. I mean, I'm not trying to say that there's collusion going on their table, but I'm just being honest. Are those Chiefs trainers going to really be like, oh, yeah, we've got a birth to the Super Bowl on the line. We're not going to let you play. I think if he's anywhere close to being able to play, he's going to play. But I don't think he's going to be 100%. The Bills are not the Browns. They are a much better team. They're not going to make the mistakes that the Browns did. They've got Josh Allen in there with a solid system uh, led by Sean McDermott. I think the defense is much better. I think the Bills are going to pull off the upset. I really think this is kind of one of those years where the Bills, I'm not going to say they're the team of destiny yet, but it kind of does feel like it's uh, turning out to be a special season for Buffalo. And it certainly would be great if they ended up winning it all to be able to kind of erase what happened in the 90s when they lost four straight. So I am going with Buffalo to win this game. Uh, I'm going to say something like 31-23. I think Mahomes – not 100%. It's still better than most guys at 100%, but I think the Bills are just too good of a team to uh, for the Chiefs to handle if, uh, if Mahomes is not 100%. So Corey and Mitch are going with uh, the Chiefs. I'm going with Buffalo. All three of us agreed on the uh, Packers winning in the NFC, so my Super Bowl potentially would be Packers and Bills. Corey sticking with his original prediction, Packers and Chiefs. Uh, Mitch is also going Packers and Chiefs. I wanted to ask you guys real quick, What's the Super Bowl you want to see? I mean, I know you guys are right now predicting Packers and Chiefs, but what personally, what would you want to see? Do you want to see the Bills and the Bucks, or, uh, you know, the Packers and the Bucks, or uh, another combination? I mean, Mitch, I'll go to you first. I know you picked Packers and Chiefs. Is that necessarily the Super Bowl that you want to see? I do. I think from a storyline standpoint, it's the better game going with Rodgers against Mahomes. I do think also stylistically for Green Bay, I think a matchup against the Chiefs is more favorable than going up against the Bills because like I've mentioned several times, I think Green Bay can run the football in Kansas City. If they can do that, I think that'd be a problem for the Chiefs because I think Green Bay could keep it out of their hands. Then that opens up play action, which has been very effective for them. I think from a storyline perspective, I'd take Packers Chiefs. Also from a style standpoint, Packers Chiefs as well. Although I do think in a different ways, Green Bay's could match up with Buffalo as well, if they're able to beat Tampa, of course. Corey, if Packers Chiefs the Super Bowl that you necessarily want to see, or is there another combination you think might be more intriguing? Uh, I think the combination I'd want to see actually is the Super Bowl you had, uh, Packers-Bills. I think that would be an awesome game to watch and awesome to see that, that city of Buffalo have their team in the Super Bowl, the Bills Mafia. We've talked about that before, how wild and crazy that fan base is and what that would mean for, for them to have their team, you know, get back to the Super Bowl after all those those years of disappointments and getting, what was it, four straight years of losing it and stuff like that. So I think for, for them to make it would be certainly a, a sightseeing. I think, you know, we're kind of tired of, of our, I'm personally tired of seeing Brady in a Super Bowl, even if it is with a different team. So I would like to see, you know, Rodgers, you know, get back there and a, a chance to win his second kind of a, a redemptive story this year. Yeah, I want to say I agree with you guys. I think, like, look, we're all tired of Brady winning it. We're tired. I, I mean, I personally don't want the Chiefs to win it because I, I, I like to see kind of the parody. I mean, there hasn't been a repeat champion in the NFL since 03 and 04. But, and the Packers and Chiefs, by the way, would be a great matchup. But I'm going to say the Bucks and the Chiefs. I think that would be a really good matchup to see Tom Brady against Patrick Mahomes. Now, they did already play in the AFC Championship game a few years ago. But I think that would probably truly be the kind of the passing of the torch, you know, Mahomes, but people are saying he has the capability to be the, the greatest of all time, playing against a guy who is widely considered the greatest of all time. I think that would be a great storyline to see the young Mahomes, who's already won a Super Bowl, trying to repeat against the old veteran Tom Brady, who's 43 years old. Again, uh, guys, we don't know if the Bucs are going to win this weekend or if uh, they will advance, but I do want to ask you guys, Mitch, I'll start with you first. Do you think this is Brady's last run? Because I personally, I think he's won. And this is something else you can comment on. I think Brady has won the mer the divorce rather with Belichick. 
uh, because uh, he's, you know, potentially playing for a Super Bowl and Bill Belichick is sitting at home. Although I will say the Patriots had a better season than the record might indicate. But what are your thoughts? Do you think this is Bra probably Brady's last run or do you think, hey, you never know, at 44 he can make it happen again? You know, I think he's going to be back next season, and I think he could certainly do it again as the Bucks bring back their main core. Uh, to go back to your actually last point there, if it is a Bucks Super Bowl, they're getting it in their home stadium as well, which would be a first for the NFL having a home team host the Super Bowl. But I, I do agree with you. I do think if Tom, if Tom Brady makes the Super Bowl and if he wins the Super Bowl, I think if anything, it solidifies him as the GOAT. I think he is the GOAT already. But if he's able to go to the Super Bowl with another team in his first year, it says a lot considering that team hasn't been to the playoffs since 2007 and let alone won a playoff game since 2002 when they last won the Super Bowl. And I think it does say something about the Patriots as well. And I think Tom Brady getting upset about not really having anyone to throw to. And I think you really saw those weapons in New England come to life this year. I've been a big Cam Newton guy. I still am. But, you know, he didn't have anyone to throw to. It just felt like the passing game was so hard from a New England. Cam is limited as a passer. But at the same time, the weapons there around him are not all that good. I mean, Julian Edelman was hurt for most of the season. So I think Tom Brady is cementing his legacy even more by this run he's on right now. If he wins another Super Bowl in Tampa, I think he's surefire the GOAT because he's done it again with a new team and a new system in one year. So I do think Brady does have one more run maybe next year if they do bring a good piece of that core back. And, and who knows, if he said next year or going into next year that it is his last year, you never know. He might have one last run in him. For sure. Uh, Corey, what do you think? Obviously, it would be great if Tampa hosts the Super Bowl in its own stadium, but do you think this is potentially Brady's last run, uh, deep run in the playoffs? I, mean, I certainly don't think so. I mean, I think as long as Tom Brady is playing in this league, he always has the capability, and that team will always have the capability to make a run. So until he, he officially, you know, rides off into the sunset, until he officially retires from the game, that's that's when I say this will be his last run that, that season before that. So I mean, by all indications, he's coming back next year, and I would certainly would, would put whatever uh, whatever pieces the Bucks are able to bring back in him along as a, a favorite even in the NFC if, 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 like Mitch was saying, all those pieces are coming back and, and Brady can kind of do it again with, you know, the, the core that he has there. Yeah, I'm not going to count Brady out. And I think, guys, I was having this conversation with someone else. If you look at who's won the Super Bowl, it, very rarely a young quarterback. I mean, Josh Allen winning it, I think, would be a novice. I mean, Patrick Mahomes won it last year, but people agree. I mean, he's an all-time great talent. I mean, you look at the guys who have won Super Bowls, it's been guys like Brady, uh, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, guys who had years on them in the NFL. So I certainly think if Brady comes back, if I'm, you know, I haven't seen anything that couldn't make me think that he could make another deep run. And certainly if he wins it all this year, I agree with you, Mitch. I think he's already the GOAT. But I think, honestly, if he wins it this year, I think you're having a conversation. You may have had the greatest career out of any American professional athlete. Uh, but that already is a conversation. I think, I certainly think it's, uh, I mean, I personally think he has, he's had a better career than Michael Jordan, but that can be another conversation for another day. But uh, definitely uh, it would be great if he won the Super Bowl. And if he didn't win, it doesn't affect his legacy. He's already got six, way more than most of the people near him. But close out the podcast, guys. I want to talk about some of the NFL uh, head coaching vacancies that have, that are still um, available. I mean, I think you've got a team like the Texans where there's a lot of uncertainty whether or not Sean Watson will be with that team uh, going forward. And you've still got a number of, uh, of coaching candidates, guys like Eric Bieniemy and Brian Dable, the Bills offensive coordinator. Bieniemy the Chiefs offensive coordinator. Uh, Doug Peterson, who won a Super Bowl with the Eagles three years ago, is still out there. Corey, I guess that's kind of my interesting question is you've seen, you know, these teams make their hires, the Chargers hiring Staley or the Jets hiring Robert Sala. Uh, Lions hiring Dan Campbell, the Saints assistant head coach. I guess I'm just kind of curious why the enemy or Dable or even Doug Peterson haven't been hired yet. I mean, I feel like these guys are pretty qualified candidates. The reasoning I've heard is the fact that because these guys' teams are still in the playoffs, uh, teams that are looking for head coaches don't want to wait till the playoffs are over because that will put them behind in terms of hiring staff. But I guess to me, I'm like, well, if they're still in the playoffs, that means they're still pretty good. And I would rather have them than maybe – Another one of these guys that were on a team that wasn't that good. What are your thoughts on why maybe B enemy and Dable and Doug Peterson have not been hired yet by you know, some of these teams? Yeah. I mean, with, with B enemy and Dable, that's the exact reason is they're, they're not able to be hired yet. And they're at, they're actually at a disadvantage for being one of the better, if not best coaches, you know, at their current position right now as offensive coordinators. And it, it's really mind baffling 
or mind boggling that that's, you know, a rule that's still out there in the NFL that they can't be hired and can't be, you know, taken away during the playoffs. Cause I mean, you even see it in, in college football. You saw it with, with Steve Sarkeesian this year, you know, he's, he's hired away in the middle of Alabama making their national championship run. And, you know, he's still able to, the coach in that national championship, he's still able to do all of that. And then as soon as the season ends, go and, you know, do what he needs to do at Texas. So it really makes no sense that they can't do that in the NFL, that you're putting these guys that are, you know, still in the playoffs that are still leading their teams to the promised land at a disadvantage. It's, it's a mind boggling rule. It's a mind boggling thing that's going on there. And I, I certainly think, you know, you look at, you know, Eric B especially he's been in the conversation as a head coach for the last couple of years and hasn't been able to latch on anywhere. That's, that's kind of, you know, hard for a hard pill to swallow when you see, especially all the success that he's had at Kansas city and, and what he's kind of meant to that team along with Andy Reid. Uh, Mitch, we have two remaining head coaching vacancies left, the Eagles and the Texans. Who do you think would be good fits for either of those positions? I would say if the Texans want any shot of keeping Deshaun Watson happy and keeping him in Houston, they better go get Eric Bieniemy. even though I think all hope might be lost for keeping Deshaun Watson. They might have to trade him considering the rumors right now. But I think Eric Bieniemy is the guy for Houston. I think he's a good offensive mind. I think he's a guy that would know how to use Deshaun Watts. I think him and Patrick Mahomes are very similar in a sense. And I think he can build an offense, certainly around his capabilities. So I think Bieniemy is a guy in the making who's due for head coaching job. And I think the Houston job is very attractive with or without Watson, because if they do trade him, you'd figure they're probably going to get a very high draft pick in this year's draft for him. It could leave them with a good quarterback option or even, even beyond that they might have a shot at somebody else for the Eagles. It's interesting. I don't know who the best guy would be. I think Josh McDaniels does make a lot of sense because I think considering the season he just came off with, with the Patriots, I think he learned how to use a mobile quarterback a little bit. So if you make the transition to Philadelphia, where I would assume Jalen hurts is your guy, I I'm off the Wentz wagon. And I think the Eagles should trade him. I think the Colts make sense to do that, but that's a completely different conversation. But I would assume Jalen Hurts is the guy in Philadelphia. And I think now you have Josh McDaniels, who has familiarity using a running quarterback, which seemed to be taking over the NFL. Now these mobile quarterbacks who can make plays with their arm and their legs. I think Hurts would be perfect with McDaniels. There are weapons in that offense. Miles Sanders is a terrific running back. They still have Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard's emerging. So, and there's weapons on that Eagles team. I think Josh McDaniels might be the guy to enhance those guys, those guys on that offense and get the Eagles back into a relevant position, in the NFC East. Corey, really quick, I wanted to ask you, uh, which hiring do you think was the best hiring? I mean, you saw Urban Meyer getting hired by the Jags, Robert Sala going to the Jets, Arthur Smith uh, getting hired by Atlanta, the Titans offensive coordinator. Any one of those uh, hiring stand out to you as the best uh, hiring by one of those teams? I mean, I, I certainly think it's the most controversial hire, but I am going to say that Urban Meyer hire, I think, you know, you look at him, he's won wherever he's been uh, in college football. Obviously, it'll be a different story in the NFL, but, you know, obviously he'll have Trevor Lawrence to build around with that first pick. He'll have a, a team there. I think the thing is that the you look at this Jacksonville team, you know, can you even name like the coaches that they've had over the past couple of years? They had Doug Marone, obviously. He's the most recent one, but you look back at some other guys and they've just never had any big names there. They've never really had a culture be put in place there. I think that's exactly what Urban Meyer will bring is a, a tough, hard-nosed culture there to that team and, and really some of the innovative ideas that, that I'm sure he has rolling up. It'll really be, you know, who he hires as his coordinators will be a big deal moving forward. But I think that's, in my mind, it's a, a controversial hire, a, a hire that could go bad or it could go really good. But I think it's going to go really good for, for that Jacksonville team. Mitch, what do you think? I'm going to go with Robert Sala for the Jets. I think this is a good defensive coordinator uh, type of coach after Adam Gase, who was a flawed offensive coordinator. You bring him in, there's also reports Sal is going to bring in Mike LaFleur to be his offensive coordinator, the brother of Matt LaFleur, the Packers head coach. Uh, I think this means they're going to stick with Sam Darnold, which I personally believe is the right decision. You know, the Jets have a cap space. They've got draft picks. I personally would like to see him draft Devontae Smith with that second pick. Then you've got a really good receiver there to pair with Sam Darnold. You let Sal work on the defensive side of things. I think he's got a personality, which is good for the New York media market. So I'm going to go with Robert Sala. Any of those coaching hires you think is the right move? I would agree with you. I think Sala was the best one. I was surprised he didn't get a job last season after the year the San Francisco 49ers had. I was even more shocked. I didn't. The Lions didn't hire Robert Sala. I thought that was the home run for them. They need a guy to fix that defense, and I think he would have been the guy. 
But I think Salah is the guy you want in New York. I think he's a guy who's not going to be phased by the media there. I think he's going to get a new culture installed with the Jets. And I think they've got pieces there. I'm 50-50 on Darnold. I think they should put him out there and see what they can get. I think if you're looking realistically, maybe a second-round pick. Maybe you can swap him to the Texans for Deshaun Watson if he's indeed available. Put a package together there because they have a lot of first-round picks as well coming from the Jamal Adams deal. So I think there's options there. So if they want to move him and go get a franchise quarterback, get something that's a surefire guy who can play in this league, I'd do that. But I do think the Jets are in a very good spot. I think they're if they want to go get Devontae Smith with the number two pick, I think that makes sense for them because they do need wide receiver help. But the Jets are in a good position. I think Robert Sala is the guy that can get him in the right direction. The higher that I think I'm most questionable about would be the Chargers one. I think the defensive coordinator for the Rams could help them because their defense does need some help. But man, I'll tell you what, if Eric Bieniemy ended up with the Chargers, I don't think they wanted to wait that long to make their head coach hire because the Chiefs are still going. Having an offensive mind like the enemy with that offense, Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, Hunter Henry, that offense could maybe go to a new level that I don't think people thought they'd get to. I think that was one that surprised me. But otherwise, I think, like Corey said with the Jaguars, I think that was a really good hire. And I think Sal is the top one for the Jets. For sure. Well, guys, this has been such a great podcast. Before we go, Mitch, uh, we always like to give our guests the opportunity to provide a hot take whether it's, you know, whatever the sport is, you know, you can, I know you're a Bucks fan. You can talk about the NBA. You can talk about the MLB, the Brewers, uh, you know, any hot take you want to put out there, you think this is going to happen in sports sometime in the future. Ooh, you're putting me on the spot with that one. <laughs> I'm not a big NBA guy. I'll tell you that much. I'm like, I'm not diehard into the NBA. I'm more of a college basketball kind of guy I cover the Badgers, of course, but I'll say this. I don't think the Brooklyn experiment with James Harden, Kyrie Irving, and Kevin Durant, it's going to end all that well. I don't think they're going to go to the NBA finals. I'd still take Milwaukee over them. And this is coming from a guy who's not a super big Bucks fan. I think Milwaukee's still the better team, although Brooklyn did just beat them. I just, there's something about Kyrie Irving that I've never been a fan of wherever he's been. I think he's going to be problems. I think Kevin Durant and James Harden are fine, but Kyrie Irving, if they traded him, I, I think that'd be a good move. I think it could be an addition by subtraction. Go get some complimentary pieces. But if it's a bull take, I would say the Brooklyn Nets, I think, could be heading into fire, possibly, with the big three they put together now. Honestly, I'm not sure that's such a hot take, Corey. I mean, uh, Charles Barkley said it best. Kevin Durant went from the Splash Brothers to the Dribble Brothers. So uh, it'll be interesting to see whether or not this experiment works out. What do you think about that? Do you think the Nets have a chance to make it work out? Yeah, I think they, they can make it work out, but it will certainly, like we said last time, is, is there enough basketballs to go around for all of those guys on there? Uh, Mitch, I will ask you, as you know, Badgers fan, college basketball, how far do you think that team advances in the tournament this year? Because you look at them, you know, the big story with them was they have all five, you know, senior starters returning this year and everything. And honestly, they, they have been a little bit of a disappointment after winning the Big Ten last year. So how, how, how far in the tournament do you think they advance this year? I still think their final four good. They have things to figure out. That's for sure. I think defensively, there's a work in progress in some aspects. They do struggle against athletic dribble penetration. That's been known. And Nate Reavers, who was, I think, supposedly their best player coming into the season. A lot of people pegged him as the guy who'd be most likely to finish on Big Ten first team. I've always thought Demetri Trice is their best player, but Nate Reavers hasn't played to, I think, the expectation people would think that is something that's holding Wisconsin back right now. But the Big Ten is just so good. If Wisconsin gets some confidence at the end of the year, and this has been the case with Bo Ryan and Greg Gard, they've always been very strong to finish the season. They have a very tough final four or five games of the year before going into the Big Ten tournament. But this team is still, I think, final four good when they figure it out. They're deep. They're older than the Chicago Bulls. I know that's been thrown out a lot in terms of their starting lives. So they certainly have a lot of veteran presence on this team. I think especially during – a global pandemic kind of season, it matters considering all the adversity you can go through. They went through a lot last season, but I think Wisconsin's still in a good shape. I picked them to win the Big Ten. I still think they're going to, even how well Michigan and I was playing, but they have a lot to improve on. Gonzaga's clearly the front running team. Baylor is not too far behind, but I still think Wisconsin can win the Big Ten and get to the Final Four. Well, that would certainly be a bull take indeed if it does, in fact, happen. Mitch, this has been such a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Talk about the Packers, the NFL, Wisconsin, even just a second ago. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on here soon. Thanks so much for joining us. 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was great talking with you guys. And Corey, very excited for uh, sports, what's going to happen with uh, the NFL playoffs this weekend and some other stuff like um, the NBA season kind of starting to take a little bit of form now with some more storylines and uh, college basketball too. We're about a month away from saying we're almost to March and very exciting time to be a sports fan as we uh, continue to move forward in 2021. Yes, sir. Certainly no shortage of sports to be watching right now. So you got to love that. Sure. Well, this has been uh, such a pleasure on the latest edition of the uh, Real Talk with Billy and Corey, featuring our special guest, Mitch Speltz, for my podcast partner, Uncle Cornelius Michael Van Dyke. I'm Hot Take Billy Park, Tim on end. We thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. Love you, 2000.